This year started off pretty badly for press freedom in Myanmar. A court has sentenced two journalists from the Reuters news agency to seven years in jail. In early January, the two Reuters journalists, who were sentenced to seven years in prison for essentially doing their job, had their sentences upheld by the high court in Yangon. The two journalists had reported on an unflattering story about the military's aggressive campaign against the Muslim Rohingya minority in Rakhine State. Needless to say, the military and the government were not too happy about their reporting. The official line of the government has been that the two journalists were arrested for being in possession of classified materials, a violation of an obscure, archaic, colonial-era law. Yet the classified materials they were in possession of were given to them by police. The journalists allege that the police had framed them. The reporters say the charges are false and they were framed. And they say the arrest was done to silence their reporting and intimidate the press. The police had carried out a sting operation in which they pretended to be sources with documentation of the military's atrocities against the Rohingya in Rakhine. The journalists fell for it and were arrested moments later for being in possession of documents that the police themselves had provided them with. The case of the two Reuters journalists has garnered international attention. Well, it is a travesty. I mean, they're, they're convicted of breaking the Official Secrets Act, um, and they were given the secrets by the police. The truth will come out, the truth is coming out, and it will continue to come out. Uh, Canada has to be at the forefront of the efforts to make sure those responsible are, in fact, held accountable. When the American Vice President, Mike Pence, met with Aung San Suu Kyi, he publicly called for the release of the two journalists. Let me also say that in America, we, we believe in our democratic institutions and ideals, including a free and independent press. Uh, the arrest uh, and jailing of two journalists last fall was deeply troubling to millions of Americans. And uh, I look forward to speaking with you about the premium that we place on a free and independent press. The High Court in Yangon reached its verdict on January 11th and affirmed the previous sentencing of the two journalists. The fate of these two journalists looks bleak, and so does the fate of press freedom and democracy in Myanmar. This whole case really raises questions regarding the freedom of the press and the freedom of expression in Myanmar. There was so much... The case has cast a spotlight on Myanmar's difficult transition to democracy after nearly five decades of military rule. Analysts say it illustrates deteriorating press freedom. Uh, the foreign diplomats and the journalists were simply outraged. The Japanese government has conveyed its concern about this matter to the government of Myanmar. Freedom of speech, basic human rights and the rule of law are immutable common values shared by the international community and it is important for all nations to safeguard these values. Amnesty International, the US and the European Union have all called for their release. Uh, I look forward to speaking with you about the premium that we place on a free and independent press. Oliver, you've done some reporting on this. Why were these two journalists arrested? Uh, I think if you go back to December uh, 2016, uh, it was a few months after the crisis in Rakhine State started. Uh, obviously it started in the August of that year. Um, and then over those few months, these stories of atrocities at the hands of particularly of the military had come out and a lot of people were um, investigating what had gone down. Uh, a lot of people had gone to try to get into Northern Rakhine State, some with limited success, some with some success. Many others, particularly sort of those being foreigners here, found it easier to report from the Bangladesh side of the border. Um, but while alone in Chosu in particular, uh, they were at some point they'd, they'd been up, I think they'd been up to Rakhine State, and that's where they then covered this story about the the massacre at Indian, um, where <coughs> military members were found to be uh, involved in the killing of ten Rohingya men at the village. Uh, so it was quite clearly, it was quite clear that they were arrested for the work they were doing, uh, even though the, the claims were that it was, I think in the end they were done under the unofficial secrets act. It was very clearly a message sort of sent because Reuters released their story, I think, in the February or at least a few months after they arrested, and clearly they were working on that story at the time. 
I think it's quite clear if you look at it that the message was sent, for one, for Reuters not to run that story, which of course they did. It was a fantastic bit of reporting. But it was also a message to any other journalists here, uh, particularly those who are Myanmar, was to to report on this, or not to report on this, and not to report on this side of things, of questioning the official narrative that the military had committed with these atrocities. So they were essentially arrested for doing their job? Absolutely, yeah. So the Rohingya are, of course, the Muslim minority in Rakhine State that the Burmese military is driving out of Myanmar. How is it for Frontier, for example, to try to cover this? How is it difficult with the military and the government trying to shut down the free press and reporting on this? Yeah, we've been, uh, I think, at Frontier, when we've, as a publication, we've only been around since 2015. But this crisis has been reported on from inside the country and from outside the country since really... 2012, which is when the um, communal violence... Now, the Rohingya have been oppressed for many, many years, for decades. Uh, They've had restrictions on their movement, restrictions on livelihoods, restrictions on jobs, even marriages they had to go through, particularly in the northern Rakhine, had to go through uh, these kind of oppressive um, state apparatus to to get permission for anything. But then in 2012, um, some violence flared up there in, the I think, in the June time. um, Three Muslim men were found to have raped and killed a Rakhine woman. And this led to some violence. Um, the next, next, over the next few days, a bunch of Muslim men were attacked. And there was this sort of this tit for tat violence between the two communities up there. Uh, and that sort of flared up, and that, that kind of got, I think, that got the world's attention to, to the Rohingya population. Um, the Rohingya were kind of herded into these camps, just on the, many on the outskirts of Sitway, where um, they were sort of told they'd be held there temporarily. And these camps are still there, six, seven, eight years later. Restrictions are getting even tighter. Uh, I have some some friends there, actually, who, who I speak with on a regular basis, and the conditions are dreadful in those camps. Uh, so that was kind of the first time anyone started reporting on it, and it was it was challenging at the time. People were able to go around then and travel to Sitway, for example, which is the state capital there, uh, get permission to, to go into those camps, and generally you'd get the permission, you would be able to report on what was happening, but it was, it was always quite difficult at that point even to go to, to Northern Rakhine. And then actually in... Um, then the attacks had happened, the initial attacks by the group that we now know as ARSA had happened, I think, in the October of 2016. Um, and that sort of changed things. Got These were smaller attacks just outside Mongdo, and that changed things a little bit. Things got a little tighter. It came a little bit harder to get into these camps. I mean, for example, I was there in the June, July, after, a few months after, into, so what would that be, 2016? So I'm trying to remember now. 2017, sorry, that would be. Um, and we went up there with some colleagues. We worked actually on a podcast of our own. And we spent about four or five days around Sitway just trying to get access into these camps on the outskirts of town. And we just weren't allowed them. We weren't given any reasons why. We were just being stalled and stalled and stalled by the authorities there. And eventually we just had to come back to Yangon um, without, without that access. And we did a couple of interviews by phone, but it obviously wasn't. We weren't able to see the conditions of the camps. Um, and then when the August 25 attacks happened, um, it got even harder. And now I don't think. Unless you go on one of these government trips, the government takes you on these trips to, to Northern Rakhine. They, but if you, unless you go on one of those trips, you can't even visit the camps now. Um, uh, you know, even when you apply permission. So that's probably a roundabout way of answering your question. It's it's a very challenging environment. You've got to, to get first hand information can be really challenging because you're relying sometimes on phone signal, which is not always good in those areas. Um, you don't get a lot of information out of the government here, and so just in general speaking. So what a lot of people had to resort to is to go to Bangladesh, where at least for those first few months, the Bangladesh authorities were very willing to have journalists in and to sort of report on what's happening there. Um, I haven't been able to go back myself, so I'm not sure what the current situation is in Bangladesh. Um, But it makes it challenging. It means you can't sort of travel around those areas in in northern Rakhine State and really get a a real grasp of what's happening. And what is ARSA? ARSA is the Arakan Rohingya Salvation Army. Um, they're a militant group. Um, they this were formed, uh, the first attacks they launched were in, I think it was October, two, I'm trying to get, I'm get my dates a bit mixed up here, but October 2016. Um, this was, so things, things have gone a little bit quiet up in Rakhine. We sort of knew what was going on, but things have kind of died down. And then on the night, actually one of our reporters, Marat, was up there at the time reporting on the drugs issue up there. He got a phone call. Um, that night, we'd been hanging around with the police because they wanted to try and do some stories on the drug busts up there. And about a few hundred, maybe a few dozen, I can't remember now, 
um, a, a paramilitant. So at the time, were calling themselves, I think they were called Al Yakin, which was the faith movement at the time. They launched these about a handful of attacks on police outposts, killing I think it was about a dozen officials up there. Um, and that kind of started up. That became over the next few months. They sort of changed their name from Al Yakin to Arsa. And then over the next few months, these stories emerged of allegedly of Arsa killing informants, killing. Um, members of the communities up there who were perceived to be close with uh, the military. Um, and then um, also then, you know, they've got a Twitter page. It's It was only updated for the first time the other day, just for the first time in a few months. So where they, they sort of commu- they seem to communicate. No one's really sure who's behind that page, uh, but that's the best form of communication anyone seems to really have with them. Um, and they launched those attacks. They said that they were justified because of the oppression of the Rohingya minority. Um, and you know, it would appear that Arsa is still active up in that area. They they launched, according to the government at least, and there was a video doing the rounds that was had the Arsa logo on it of them ambushing a police um, patrol about about two weeks ago. So we'll wait and see if um, you know the, the group does still see, st- still seem to be present, and um, we'll see what sort of happens moving forward. So Aung San Suu Kyi has been silent on both of these issues, or at least she's failed to stand up for either press freedom or the Rohingya. Uh, she hasn't spoken up for the two journalists who were arrested from Reuters, and she has failed to take a clear stance on what is happening to the Rohingya right now. In fact, she even defended the rest of these two journalists, saying that... Well, I think what I want to know is whether they feel that there has been a miscarriage of justice. And you know, of course, that due process allows them to appeal the sentence. Mm. But I, I guess you also, as a democratic leader... Um, um, don't feel comfortable with journalists being jailed? It's not a matter of, we, they were not jailed because they were journalists. Mm. They, were, they were jailed because the court has, well, sentence had been passed on them because the court has decided that they had broken the Official Secrets Act. Mm. Isn't she, as a Nobel Peace Prize winner and a human rights icon, someone you would expect to stand up for press freedom and for minority rights? I think that's been the global. That was the global opinion of her for many, many years. Um, you know, I was I was lucky enough to be here in those years in 2012 when her party won the by-election, the, the 2015 general election when the NLD had that incredible victory there. And I think the world did sort of perceive her as this human rights icon. Um, but you know, she's not that. She's she's a, and she says this herself um, that she's a politician. Um, and I think yeah, we've looked at, we, for a long time. The world has looked at her through the wrong spectrum. Um, she has not stood up for um, the Rohingya minority. She's not stood up for pretty much any of the minority. There's still fighting happening in the north of the country with the Kachin, the Shan, and many others. And she's really, I think there's a lot of disappointment, especially in the border areas, how she's failed to speak up for these values that I think many people thought that she held dear. And on press freedom, yeah, as you say, um, she has, I think the few public comments she's made on the arrest of these journalists, she's basically said that they committed crimes and they essentially they deserve to be where they are in, in the same prison and yeah that is I mean that is disappointing I suppose um, I think or well, it was I think you, you, now you're kind of just not expecting too much for her on this front she doesn't believe this to be um, as important an issue as maybe we thought she did um, yeah what do you think her end game is uh, I think she believes she's the person to lead this country she, you know, her father was this country's independence hero he was very, he is still very much loved, and I think she she sort of views this as a kind of legacy, a continuing of his legacy. Um, she, you know, in terms of her, what her end goal is, no one really knows. I don't think. I don't think. Um, I think I'd be speculating, but um, you know, she does certainly has seems to be siding closely with the military. Um, if you look at, again the peace process, she's really failed to speak out on what are quite obviously some Tamador aggressions against some of the minority groups. She's um, made some comments that, you know, that she's uh, that have been quite positive towards the military now. Um, um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's difficult. So that some of the comments that now we hear coming out from her were the exact comments made by the military regime against her and against her kind of democracy movement. So it's quite unusual. Um, but, yeah, she's, I mean, she's leading this party into the next election um, and we'll see what goes from there really. Do you think she really wants democracy for Myanmar? Depends what you mean by the word democracy, right? I think we have a, an understanding of um, what we believe democracy to be in the West. Take that with inverted commas, the West. 
Um, and I don't think I think the word democracy is a bit, it was a bit of a buzzword for a while. Um, I'd say she has she has she wants what her her, her view of democracy is here. And what is that? Um, I mean, I think there's, there's no doubt that she wants development of this country. You know, um, she her first comments were that she wants the end to the civil wars. Uh, I guess the, uh, the big criticism of her approach is that it's the wrong way of going about it. You know, um, the, this government, this NLD government, has not really made any effort to reach out to these ethnic minorities that have suffered at the hands of the, the central government for decades. Um, they always, she sort of, sort of still sometimes seems to sort of scold. She's made some comments that are see, perceived to be quite patronising, where she sort of told them to to come to the peace process, but then you've still got these kind of um, you know, aggressions being led by the Tatmadaw themselves. Um, but yeah, so I mean, I think she wants peace here. She wants um, development. I think that's true. But the way of going about them, I think a lot of people disagree with her approach. Mm. So do you think the people of Myanmar want democracy as well? Because a lot of people on social media, uh, on different websites, have called these two journalists traitors. A lot of people have a lot of animosity towards Rohingya. They don't think they should have citizenship. Do you think? What do you think the general understanding of what democracy is is in Myanmar? Yeah, I think for a long time that word democracy was kind of a buzzword. Um, it was a thing that people would shout in the streets, but understanding actually what it was is it's still relatively new here, and for, and for for obvious reasons, it's still um, quite quite a new concept I suppose if you go back to your comments about the um, the lack of support for the, the Reuters journalist I think um, there's not been a long history in this country of independent journalism we're talking about six seven years before this country sort of started to, to open up in 2011 you essentially had state-run propaganda um, and you had sort of activist journalism done from these XR media groups so this understanding of like strong investigative journalism questioning the official narrative of the government are just quite still quite new for a lot of people so they and then when you have this I, you know I, I often quite refer to it as a blind spot the, 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 the Myanmar kind of people's many, many Myanmar people's views of the Rohingya it's just this oh they don't belong in this 135 list of ethnic groups this arbitrary list that was sort of dreamed up by they win um, that they don't belong here now of course you know that's when you're getting into ethnicity is you know um it's one, you know, I'm this, 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 you know, and I'm this, that ethnicity. Now, people aren't that, you know, especially in a country like this with so this fluid movement of people for decades. Um, so yeah, it's it's been it was it was a difficult thing to witness. You know, I love this country. I spent a lot of time here, but we're, especially around that time of of, of August twenty five, when it was clear that these people were being killed in their homes, and, and a lot of awful things were happening. Some of the comments, particularly on social media, but also in, sometimes in the public domain, that either that they were lying, or that they somehow deserve this because they belong to this ethnic group were horrible things to witness um, and I should say I, I went up to Bangladesh in those few weeks after it happened and to have seen the scale of human suffering there and it's still happening today it was, it was horrendous it was it was just horrid to watch to, to see to hear the stories of of, of, of whole family like a man coming home to find his family killed in his home women have had these you know these awful things happening to them um, and then to have come back here and heard other some people who I viewed as friends at the time, say things that were just horrible to hear. That was really not a nice thing to hear. Um, I think now there's a general acceptance, even though it's kind of quietly going around, that, that these things did happen. There's just so much evidence that that you know what what we were what people were saying was happening at the time did happen. And I just hope that um, you know hopefully there's one day there's there's some sort of mechanism in place for for justice to happen, whether or not that happens or not. I guess only time will tell. So as of right now, what do you think the fate of these two journalists will be? Those things stand. They're in jail for another six years. I mean, that's, that's justice in this country, right? Do you think they can get a pardon from the president? I mean, <laughs> I know what I think they should do. They should be released. <laughs> um, but whether or not they will be, who knows in this place, you know. Um, that you know that whole thing shouldn't have gone to trial for the first place. They shouldn't have been arrested. Um, and... At the moment, as this thing stand, they face another six years in prison away from their families. And at this point, there's nothing to say they won't stay there for the next six years. And on a grander scale, what do you think will be the fate of press freedom and democracy in Myanmar? It's going to go through a lot more bumps along the way. Um, I would say 
despite what's happened with the, with these these two journalists, other journalists have been arrested as well previously. Most I think most have now been released. I would say looking at a bigger picture thing on the press freedom front, things have improved in the last six years. Um, you know, we're even sat in the Frontier office, and Frontier is able to do some really fantastic, in-depth journalism, looking at really important issues, been able to publish. You wouldn't have been able to do that prior to 2012 when they had this pre-publication censorship where anything you wrote um, had to go through these censors and if they didn't, if the military didn't like it, or sorry, should I say the, the government, whoever it was at the time, didn't like it, they just literally put a big red pen through it. Um, so I think, you know, you've got, you know, you've got a couple of journalism schools in this country. We work with some of the young journalists here who are terrific, you know, really passionate about sort of truth seeking and holding people to account for their actions. So I'd say... Things are proving. Things have improved, should I say, despite what these obvious setbacks that we, we know are happening. And um, I think the country will go through some good moments, some bad ones again in the next however many years. Uh, but it's a wonderful place, you know, and I could still have a lot of, personally, and to make this, this sort of personal account, um, a lot of hope for this country. And, um, yeah, I hope that people sort of get what they deserve, which is a, a flourishing, <laughs> thriving country. All right. Thank you, Oliver. Cheers. Thanks a lot.